three passages of scripture inform uh, the sermon today. Uh, listen for the word of God as it may be found in the eighth Psalm, Isaiah 40, and early in the pages of the gospel according to Mark. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is thy name in all of the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens and out of the mouths of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes, thereby to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look to your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are humans that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. From Isaiah 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. Her understanding is not unsearchable. God gives power to the faint and to the strengthens the powerless always. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted, and those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and never faint. and from Mark. When Jesus returned from Capernaum, it was reported that he was home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room, not even in the front door. Yet he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came carrying a paralyzed man to Jesus, and when they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, why do you raise such questions? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, take your mat, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, and so he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go home. And the man stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them and all were amazed and glorified God saying, never have we seen anything like this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. I know that your watches all run fast, so I'll just go by mine. <laughs> Don't be impressed with that. I never look at it. It's just a gesture. <laughs> the, 
there are several expressions of modern slang which graphically uh, reflect the ancient hu Hebrew understanding uh, of the human condition. Um, unlike the Greeks, uh, who thought a person is composed of two parts, uh, the psyche and the soma, the soul and the body, the Hebrews understood a person as a psychosomatic unity in which body and mind are inexorably linked. Thus, the neighboring uh, Pomona College student discovering that he invited two uh, dates for the same weekend exclaimed, oh my aching back, to which his perhaps less popular but certainly less forgetful classmate said, and you give me a pain in the neck. Now, modern medicine is increasingly more like this psychosomatic understanding, asking if an illness is physical or psychological is seen more and more as asking the wrong question. The far better question is to what extent physical, to what extent psychological. So let this be the first way that we seek to understand the pathetic figure, Mark reports, was brought by Jesus to the power and the place of Jesus' teaching, an everyday place called home. Uh, could it have been, could it have been that his troubled soul was tormenting his terrified body? Um, was he not that, well, the literal embodiment of that slang expression, scared stiff? I don't know, but I do know that many of us from time to time demonstrate some of his symptoms. So let us examine our common lot by taking a closer look at this situation with the poor paralytic to see why he and sometimes we can get so scared. But first, a more modern parable. In a New England prep school of my acquaintance, a determined junior uh, with a few hostile feelings uh, and a clever cunning uh, approaching genius was regularly terrifying his teachers and amazing the dean with the ingenuity of his attacks. Having selected his English teacher uh, as his latest victim, he appeared in class one morning armed with a pair of binoculars. Seating himself in the last row of the class, he proceeded to look long and hard at his luckless victim. Through the wrong end of the binoculars. His luckless foe was uh, loath to uh, challenge him, but the tension built up and soon became unbearable, and the following conversation was exchanged between them. Anderson, what are you doing? Oh, nothing, sir. Just looking at you, sir. And you know, sir, you're only that big. Ooh. In a single leap over three rows of chairs, which almost cost the young teacher his collarbone, he grabbed the binoculars with one hand and the lad behind him with the other. For the remark had struck home. Had the lad's viewpoint been his own, I rather think that the teacher would have responded differently. But the crafty kid scored a direct hit. How? Well, he exposed and expressed the young teacher's long latent opinion of himself. How is it then that 
he and we can sometimes get so scared as to shrivel in size, and worse, in self-worth. Well, one way to think about that, of course, is the reality that from the first daybreak of life, I mean, we cannot help but see ourselves as only this big. I mean, it's not a terrible thing to be finite, but to realize that we are a can be. Another way to think about it is to have the knowledge that is spared other animals, that the luxury of life is going to be paid for by the reality of death, well, that can be a totally disabling thing. Then we cannot help but see in relation to even the observable universe, our human size is smaller than the, well, to give a projection, the, the smallest atom. Um, was not the poet prophet of the eighth Psalm speaking for us when he said, when I consider the heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast made, what is humankind that thou should be conscious, aware, concerned about the likes of us? A feeling we've all had looking up at the stars. Well, when we as a race realize that we have reached the moon and more, think about how much more there is yet to do, the knowledge alone cannot help but create some anxiety, at least for the cost of it. We may be trying to ignore it by pushing it uh, into our deep, deep subconscious. But as the parallel of, or parable of the poor teacher uh, demonstrates, the psychological and the subconscious cannot always digest it. But I can see that you are rightly still suspicious. I mean, such fright could not have totally paralyzed uh, the paralytic uh, for so long. But perhaps, think of it this way, just perhaps. Perhaps feeling a bit small after looking up at the stars one night and then not getting the attention, the time, the grade, the recognition, the dinner invitation that he was hoping for the next day. Perhaps the paralytic, well, tried to look and feel a little bit bigger by buying and driving a faster and flashier camel um, and, and, or maybe by pushing his spouse around. I mean, feeling insecure, uh, he may have tried to gain a false sense of security, which only increased his anxiety. Such searching for security is not only futile, it can be vicious. I mean, when it's not enough to be rich, as surely we all are, at the very least in comparison with the world's average person, when we want to be even richer and want to be even smarter and more popular and more talented and more virtuous and sophisticated and fashionable, when we can't be anything more than morons, that is putting moron and moron and moron, do we not become something considerably less, less than human and thereby less than lovable? And if fear-ridden stalemate is um, a competition that grows and grows, I mean, we see it personally and in community and nationally and internationally and all the more now even politically. Fear-ridden uh, level of all of this can lead to a fear-ridden stalemate on a gargantuan scale. Like the Beverly Hills matron who confided to a neighbor in that rare moment of candor. It seems that all these years when we've been trying to just keep up with you, You've only been trying to keep up with me. Well, if competitive fear is not only a losing, it can be even a laming game. And if we add in an unfair measure of guilt, <laughs> guilt, the gift that keeps on giving, it can be a real killer. 
For created as we are to love and care for one another, I mean, what else is life for? But when we wrongly use, abuse, and try to outdo unfairly one another, are we not denying our very soul's destiny? Now, this can be the worst of anxiety, a paralyzing anxiety, which can literally scare us stiff. So stiff, uh, the hands are no longer free to reach out and aid another. The arms, um, unable to embrace another. The feet, no longer free to walk out of our cozy clique of clever and fast and fashionable friends. Our eyes, no longer able to see those whose needs are far greater than our own. When one is scared stiff, one is unable to respond, and that is precisely what paralysis is, the inability to respond. And if one can't respond to others, then one is truly dead. <laughs> if not flat on our backs, then dead on our feet. Sensing this, I suppose, Mark tells us of four faithful friends of a poor paralytic brought to Jesus for a special, special reason. Now, the paralytic may have already given up on himself, but they were not about to give up on him. Lesson to us all. Oh, that all of us could have such, be such friends. Friends who brought him to the life and teachings of Jesus because in Jesus' all too brief ministry, already he had earned such a reputation uh, with the fretful and with the frightened especially, and such were the times then as the times are now. But people everywhere had heard about Jesus' uncommon concern and his close and tender care, felt his extraordinary love, and were moved by the practical teachings of true love's inexhaustible source. They knew what we today have far better reason to know, that Jesus was and ever is God's love incarnate. Another way of saying it, God's love in person, a perfect love. And the Gospel of John makes very clear, perfect love casts out all fear. So, through the press and stress of the crowd they came, in what must have been unbearable heat, four unnamed friends carrying their crippled companion. But the crowd, one said. They are too many, said another. We, we can't get near, we've got to, said the fourth. What are we gonna do? I, I, I don't know, what, what if we go up on the roof? We can't do it on the roof. What are you gonna do up there? I'll pry up the tiles and we'll get, you can't do that. Get out of the way or help, that's what we're doing. And so, up on the roof they went, pried up the towel, the tiles, the thatching, whatever, and they let down the pallet upon which the paralytic lay, right to the foot of Jesus. And how did they find Jesus? Jesus was where he always is. Where is that? At the ready whether we are ready or not. Now, if this were to happen in my house, I'd say, good Lord, what are you doing to my roof? One of the many differences between myself and Jesus, I might add, uh, for Jesus says, only to see their faith and the moving friendship that they have. Yes, it can take months, or perhaps even years, for a well-trained, especially experienced psychiatrist or psychologist, working in ideal conditions, mind you, to convince, no, better, to enable a person to hear and see and believe that he is understood, that she is accepted. What may take years for modern medicine and holistic health, Mark tells us, 
There in the press of that crowd, that hovel of a house, again, the unbearable heat, Jesus accomplishes in Mark's very favorite word in the King James Version, straight away. But we hear the word again and again as immediately. Friend, he says, your sins are forgiven. You are accepted, included, wanted, needed. You are loved. Not just because Jesus says it, but because Jesus says what is true. So let us not get distracted by trying to rationalize this wonder-filled story of Jesus healing uh, in faith, uh, nor get lost uh, measuring this mysterious uh, event to fit it into our ever cautious, uh, often contentious modern minds. I mean, let's not dismiss the story because it is hard to believe and even harder to rationally understand. Uh, but speaking of irrationality, mind you, uh, above all, let's not overlook the key element of forgiveness which Jesus is so essential, but for whatever reason to the scribes and Pharisees, always such a problem. Isn't the real reason the same healing doesn't often take place in us? Not because God's forgiving love is not offered, but we are very slow and hesitant to accept it. God's love is greater than even our most grievous of sins. Jen and Jacob remind us of that again and again and again, week after week. Yet, many of us still hold on, as we do, to about enough religion, who was it who said it, to make ourselves miserable. Yes, it's a terrible thing to be paralyzed, as any of us may be, but worse, to be healed, as Jesus invites us to be. For with the assurance, friend, your sins are forgiven, comes the command, rise up, start walking, get moving. Yes, a terrible thing to be filled with fear and guilt, but perhaps even worse, in some ways to be made whole, and therefore response able, able to respond. As long as I can feel guilty, I have an excuse. I can stay in bed, or who needs me? I have nothing to offer, nothing to give. Oh, now that is just plain and simple, a pure crock of compost. You see, God is larger than we are. But of such size, God sees us in a larger, longer, stronger opinion of ourselves. God sees us through the, through the front end of the binoculars by which we become closer and are in that view magnified to be true. Uh, uh, the South Central LA mother knew that. Did you see the picture in the paper? Uh, the t-shirt that she had for her son that she wrote on it in a magic marker upside down so that if his chin ever got resting on his chest when he was depressed, he would read it that way. I am somebody, because God don't make no junk. There's a lesson in that. When we at last realize that we do have something to give in return, that we have the love that makes us who we are, that we can get off our petty pallets and start walking and start being fully human. Yes, God's grace is freely given to all, but we are not free to accept it without responding to it. Responding to it by doing all the love, care, and kindliness which we were born and built to do. If this is too difficult, too frightening, to face alone, then we, we need such faithful friends, or better still, we may be such faithful friends to another so that we just not help us to walk along dragging our mat as a trophy of our condition, but to help us truly to mount up with wings as eagles, even at our age, before we uh, run out. Or as we say at Pilgrim Place, why slow down when you're so close to the finish line? 
I mean, we are not to be love lazy or lazy lovers, but to go on and on, never to faint, falter, flag, or fail, but to be true lovers of one another. And that's what we were born to be. Thanks be to God. Amen. The hymn is our God.